Welcome, everyone. I'm Angelo Robles, host of the Angelo Robles podcast. I have a little bit, because this will be the first time in, I think, three and a half months that I've done an interview. So I am back. I'm excited to be back. A little bit of an update that probably for the next couple of interviews, I will mention, and then we'll get past it. Many of you know me as being the founder of Family Office Association, which I've been the founder and CEO for many years. I'm still the founder, but I did sell my interest. I am no longer the CEO. I wish the great team at FOA, Family Office Association, the best. My new enterprises, besides my work on my podcast, are SFO. For those that don't know, that stands for Single Family Office, SFO Continuity, and many of you will be seeing my videos more diverse on the family office world under Family Office TV, which I also own as founder and CEO. We'll one day have an independent platform within the next six months, but for now, it'll be housed on YouTube. So welcome, everyone. I know it's been a long, long time. I'm really excited about today. We have the leading researcher on the super rich discussing scientific traits of the world's most successful individuals. Our special guest today is Dr. Rainier Zittelman. He's a historian, a sociologist, and a multiple times best-selling author. He's the author actually of 26 books, including our focus in our discussion today, The Wealth Elite. Before I introduce Dr. Zittelman, which I'm really excited about, a little bit of context. There are, now the numbers could always be a bit off, 2,640 billionaires around the world. The average age, by the way, of a billionaire is 67. The age is slightly coming down. There are 25,490 centa millionaires, and there are 265,000 defined as ultra high net worth. That would be $30 million US or more. Today with Dr. Zittelman, we're very excited. I read his book, it was incredible and I have deep thoughts and experiences on the subject as well. But we're gonna talk a little bit about the characteristics of the people that he's done deep dive interviews with, including going back to their school, their history, their learning, their motivations for self-employment, that's usually gonna be a common trait, the roles of goal setting, the importance of sales skills for financial success, the role of optimism and self-efficiency, risk orientation, the relationship between analytical and intuitive, what some people will call gut decisions, and really a big part of it's going to be on big five personality traits, which we'll get to that. So I'm going to leave you hanging a little bit on that one. And the willingness to engage in, to some degree, confrontation, non-conforming, you could say challenging the status quo. So we do have lots to discuss. Dr. Rainier Zittelman, thank you so much for being on our show today. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. So studies have shown that most people that fit the stratosphere that I described, let's call it $30 million and up, especially as you go up that food chain, $100 million, Senta quote unquote millionaires, and especially billionaires, a lot of them are entrepreneurs. They're self-employed. That's been a pattern of quote unquote creating great wealth. What has your research shown? Yes, of course, this is correct. It's a stereotype and one of the prejudices against the rich that most of them are heirs and that they inherited their wealth. But this is wrong. They're Maybe you know there's research by Forbes magazine. They have also this uh, always this list of the wealthiest people in the world in the United States. And when they started in the 80s, half of the richest men in the United States inherited their wealth and only one half were self-made. And today it's 67% self-made. So if you hear this sometimes, the saying, uh, maybe in former times it was possible to 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 be to get rich. Today it's it's all heirs. You hear it very often, especially from anti-capitalist and left-leaning people. But this is absolutely wrong. No, most of them are self-made people. And if you look on the list of the richest people in the world, you see it. Of course, they inherited something someone like Bill Gates or Jeff, Jeff Bezos maybe, but 
this is only a very small fraction from their net worth. So 99% of their net worth is self-made or more than 99%. And in my study, it was, uh, it was one precondition because I wanted to find out something about the personality traits of the rich. And so I had no interview with someone who, inherit, uh, who inherited their wealth because you can't learn anything from, from them. You can only learn something about the attitudes uh, toward coming rich if you speak with self-made people. So uh, almost every one of them was entrepreneur or investor and self-made. And even if they inherited a little bit or some, then most of their uh, net worth was from entrepreneurial uh, activities or their own investments. You noted in your book studies by Boeing Schemmelbrock that showed a couple of what I would call traits that were very identifiable among the quote unquote super rich. Now, for many people, again, that may be defined as $30 million and up, in my mind, USD, US dollars, that probably is more $100 million plus, and even closer, I could argue, to billionaires. They have an openness to experience. And I mentioned it before effectively what I could describe as lower agreeableness. Yes, this is one result, what we call the big five test. It's not an invention by me, it's a standard psychological test. We distinguish between five personality traits. And uh, one personality trait that you mentioned is openness for new experience. So, you know, this kind of people say, don't tell me this. I, I I know what it is. I, I know how, how how it is, and they do always the same thing. And of course, this is not the attitude how you can become rich. Uh, on the contrary, a lot of the people I interviewed, they even enjoyed doing things different to things how, how they are done by 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 everyone. And I think it's logical. If you do the same thing as everyone else, you can't get different results and you can't uh, become super rich or having some hundreds of millions of dollars. You have to do things in a different way and to do things in a different way, you have to think in a different way. So openness for new experience is something very, very important. It's the question, how is your first reaction if you hear something about a new idea? is your first reaction to prove why it can't work and to explain wh why, why it's a bad idea or is your first reaction to find out maybe how or, or whether it could work. This is a totally different attitude. Oh, for sure. And a little bit of some of my experiences, two relationships of mine I met through their single family offices and not to brag, but they're both in the Forbes 20. What they told me pretty much mirrors what you said. It's like, listen, I grew up in a humble background. I didn't want to be average. The average person, whatever, they get married at 29. They have 1.7 kids. They have the, if they're fortunate, the house with a white picket fence. There's nothing wrong with that. They may be great people and living a great life. I think one of them said, you know, the average person, five foot nine, I, I want to be different. I want to go against the grain. I don't know if I'd quite use the word contrarian. We may get to that if we talk a little bit about investing. But they generally look at what the populace is doing in a mass is kind of not working if the goal is to become super rich. Yes, I think what you mentioned, I like this term, average existence. I, I just saw two days ago the great documentary on, on Netflix about Arnold Schwarzenegger. I admire him. Yeah, it was really good. Yes, it's a great, I, I can recommend it to, to everyone. I read his uh, autobiography, Total Recall, and I think I read all the biographies about him. But this is an amazing uh, piece or uh, film on, on Netflix. And this was his motive. He didn't want to have an average existence. He want to go for something more, something bigger, of course. And I, I, I agree absolutely what you said. It's okay with everyone if you don't want to go this way. And if you one this like traditional values and uh, the, the life of uh, what we call average existence, it's okay. But then please don't demand money from other people who are striving for, for more. If, if you don't wanna be, if you don't wanna go this way, don't start to 
uh, to argue about inequality and, and this stuff. So uh, this is uh, typical for this um, attitude for successful people, what you find also in this uh, film documentary about Arnold Schwarzenegger. Uh, the person I mentioned, Boeing Schemmelbrock, also noted there were far more similarities among broadly the middle class and those that were probably more generically ultra high net worth, let's say from 10 to 50 million USD that were that made their wealth through employment, often working for uh, perhaps it could be a partner in a prominent legal or accounting firm, more than commonly probably a Fortune 1000 company. So there is something, I don't know if I'd use the word special, but there's a different path and different traits that entrepreneurs have even compared to those that made decent money in employment. Yes, but if you speak about people who become rich as employees, I think this is a very, very small number, maybe a little bit more in the United States where sometimes CEOs of large corporations earn really a lot, but it's a very small percentage of wealthy people. We are more focused on them because most of the cases, they are CEOs of listed companies and this listed companies, they have to give the information about the, the salaries of their employees. So we know about their net worth, but there are a lot of other entrepreneurs who, who have much more and earn much more and you can find them and in, in any list. Take, take me, for example, I was the founder of a public relation company. We had only uh, 50 employees, but uh, in, in this 50 years where I was the owner of the company, I earned as much as the CEO of, a, of one of the biggest listed companies in, in Germany with thousands or ten thousands of people working there. So in, in most cases, um, in most cases, it's very hard to become rich as an employee. And, and another thing that a lot of people don't understand, if they think about how to become rich, the first thing they think about stock investments. Uh, I believe in stock investments. I'm, uh, of, of course, I'm convinced about it, but it's, I think it's more a way to, to stay rich than to become rich in the first place. If you look again in the list of the wealthiest people of the world, they are almost all entrepreneurs, whether it's Jeff, Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk or Sasha Prin, Larry Page who founded uh, Google or Bill Gates who founded uh, Microsoft. They are all entrepreneurs. The only maybe exception where people are talking about is Warren Buffett. Uh, they, he's often quoted as an example for becoming rich uh, with stock investments, but but even he's not a typical stock in, investor. I, I could say a lot about this, but this is another topic. But even if, if you accept him as the exception from the rule, if you look at the list of the richest people, not only in the world, in every country, and then you exclude those of them who became rich because they inherited their wealth. And then you will see uh, there, there's, there, there's uh, most of them are entrepreneurs and you will find only very few who became really very rich with uh, stock investments. So I think entrepreneurship is the way to become rich. Of course, it's not <laughs> the other way around. Most entre entrepreneurs don't become rich or super rich on the country. Most entrepreneurs fail. But uh, if you look at the richest people, entrepreneurship, I think it's the way to become rich. Yeah, so we're going to get to some of the things you mentioned. And you're correct. What could be misleading to people making money in stocks and financial services is they bring up to me, my business headquarters is in Greenwich, Connecticut, the hedge fund capital of the world. They think of Ray Dalio. They think of others. They run entrepreneurial businesses that charge two and 20, that if you're successful at it, raising capital and being exactly. a good investor, but this especially raising capital, you can make a lot of money. Yes, Ray Dalio, he doesn't become became rich as a stock investor, but as an entrepreneur in his field. And this is what people don't understand. They don't understand the difference. Even Warren Buffett, uh, take Warren Buffett, 
is um, especially great in in marketing and self-marketing. Of course, he had uh, a good success over a lot of years, but why does he does all this public relation and this uh, uh, Woodstock for capitalists uh, every, every year? Because he's a genius in, in, in marketing. And this marketing is very important for him, was very important for him to raise money from other people. No doubt about it. And not just hedge funds, but in high flying worlds of anything that charges a two and 20 system, venture capital, private equity, uh, earlier on fund to funds. These are all businesses that absolutely investing is an important part of it. But how they as principals made that kind of wealth was the entrepreneurial endeavor of starting a company and a model that could be a very successful financial model. I would say broadly from my experience, Rainier, and let me know if it's true in, in Germany and in Europe and other parts of the world, I would say from probably, probably up to about 100 million outside of employment, Probably real estate is the industry where most people develop or could develop, quote unquote, millionaire wealth. As the number goes up to half a billion to a billion, that does come down and it becomes more what I would say it could be a tech entrepreneur in today's world. But talk about the value of building wealth as a multimillionaire in real estate. Yes, I, there, there's no scientific research about it, but I think if I should guess, the most important way is entrepreneurship. I mentioned this before. Then in some cases, also real estate investments and then other kind of, other kind of investments. And in terms of the subjects that you interviewed, which I believe were a little bit under 50, I think a fair number of them did have a background in real estate, building yes. up a real estate portfolio, real estate management companies. These were dynamic enterprises that are complex in one way, it involves lending in banks, but relatively straightforward in other ways. Yes, so this is like project developers. And so this is correct. Um, I spoke, maybe let's come back to the study because you know it, but uh, uh, our audience not maybe I can uh, tell a little bit more about what, what, what I did. So I spoke with you mentioned the number 45 uh, people. Um, most of them had a net worth between 30 million and 1 billion uh, uh, euros what's the same with uh, dollars. So there were a few who had some billions and there were also a few who had between 20 and 30 million but most of them had between a net worth 30 million and 1 billion uh, uh, euros. And I spoke with everyone between one and two hours. And in addition to this, every one of them completed a psychological test with 50 questions. And in the end, I had transcriptions. I think it was 1,800 pages. So a lot of stuff to, uh, to, to analyze and to find out what do they have in common? And maybe first thing, oh, okay, of course, everyone looks, what do they have all in common so that you can learn something from them? But I think there is not such a thing that is true for everyone. Not all rich people are the same as not all poor people are, are the same. You find always someone with an ex exception where it's different. But what you can find is that you can find common patterns that are true for most of them, or for, yes, that they are true and that make a difference to, to ordinary uh, people. And this was what I was looking for in my interviews. And you mentioned some of them. Maybe I can, I can mention one thing that I think is important, we spoke about it uh, before, it's um, that they love swimming against the stream in a lot of cases. I give you one example, he was not a part in this book, but uh, it's a friend of mine, I know him well, uh, I think you always, you, you also know him, it's uh, Jim, Jim Rogers, and you know, this uh, investment biker. And uh, for him, he told me a funny story. When he was young, he was invited in Manhattan to a fancy dinner. He was very young and all the others, bankers, investors were much older than he was. And 
one of them said to the other, not very loud, but so loud that everyone could hear it. How can one someone be so stupid to invest in locket shares? At this time, you know, this aircraft company, every day bad news in the newspapers, in the media, and the stock price went down. And everyone laughed very loud, with an exception, not him, because they laughed at him, because he was the one to make this investment. But later on, he became very wealthy with uh, these kind of contrarian investments. And he told me the lesson learned, the louder they laugh at you, the better it is. And this is a story that I heard different times. I, I give you another funny, maybe a metaphor from one of my interviews. Uh, uh, he's, he became rich with milk and with yogurt. He's one of the richest men in, in Germany where I live. And he gave me a fun example with cows because cows are his favorite animals because he became rich with cows. And the story that he told me, imagine there's a herd of cows walking along a path, 100 cows. And on the left hand, there's a very green and lush field. And on the right hand, there's a field that is not as near as lush, only some cramps of grass. And 99 out of this, 100 cows go to the left side, of course. And what happens, grass is eaten very fast. And one cow goes to the right side. This cow eats and eats and eats. And he told me, I'm the cow <laughs> who goes on the right side. And this, of course, it's not a guarantee on the other hand. There are some stupid people who think they are always against the mainstream. If everyone says uh, two plus two is four, he, he says it's, it has to be five because I don't want to be mainstream. Of course, this is, this is crazy. It's not a guarantee to do always uh, the, the, the opposite from what everyone does. But I think one thing is important. If you hear something from a lot of people who tell you, this is a good idea, this is a great story for investment. You should be skeptical. I think it will be very hard to earn money there on long term. If, on the other hand, there is something where a lot of people tell you, ah, forget it, this sounds very boring. This could be interesting. Hey, yeah, that's very good. I really think at the heart of the book and talking about actual scientific traits, not necessarily mindset, and mindset is important, maybe a subject for a different day, there was five specific traits, and I believe the one that was most common among the people you interviewed, and I find the same in my more anecdotal studies, was conscientiousness. Yeah. If you don't mind, if you could go over the five and give a little bit of context on what you define as being conscientious. Yes, um, this is absolutely correct. Uh, we, I mentioned this before, the so-called big five the test of big the five uh, personality traits and conscientiousness. It means not only, but this is a part of it to be thoroughly to be punctual, but always also to 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 have a purpose to to be ambitious. This is what you call with conscientiousness. And um, another thing is um, agreeableness. You mentioned this before. It means how much harmony oriented are you? Uh, are you more of the kind of guy who's engaged in conflicts? Or are you one who always looks on harmony? To be honest, the big five test that I used, I think it didn't fit so good for this uh, super rich people because the result of this test was that most of them were more like um, harmony oriented. But when I spoke with them, I saw that this is, was complete wrong. So I think this kind of test wasn't made for this kind of people, but a channel test that, that, that didn't fit so much because in reality, this was one of the results of my interviews is that um, a lot of these people are not very agreeable. Maybe not everyone is as, Donald Trump type who always, you know, gets in fight and grow with, with everyone. But of course, if you always look for harmony, it's it's very uh, difficult to be successful in, uh, in life. And we mentioned another one, uh, openness for uh, new experience. 
This is so very important. And I think it's also useful if you make the test. I think everyone, uh, I have it in the appendix of my book, The Wealth Elite. There is a test and everyone could can make it. And of course, I made also the test. And if you take me as an example, I had the almost the highest um, uh, result for, for conscientiousness, but, but in openness for new experience, I was only a little bit about average. And this gave me food of thought. Then I thought, okay, in the future, if you hear something, this is not your, this is really not your strength. Maybe you are not open enough sometimes for, for new ideas. And so this, this test can also be a good instrument for, for you if you compare your results. You know, there's a, it's, it's this way in the test. Uh, if you have, if you get 20 points, it's average, 40 points is the maximum and zero points is uh, the, the less that you can, the least that you can get. And for example, I had, I think, the 37 points with conscientiousness, but only 23 points with uh, openness for new experience. And this showed me, uh, here is some, uh, I, I hope for everyone that you find some weak points in your personality, because only if you can find some points where you are weak, there's room to, uh, to, to improve yourself. So, and another one was extroversion. You know, you know there are some people, we, you know this, how to distinguish, they are more introverted uh, versus extroverted. And these people were more extroverted. And the last one was neuroticism. It means how psychological stable you are. Of course, you can't change there is something. It's a kind you are this way or you are not this way. But the result was that uh, these people, this my interviews, they were above average in conscientiousness, in openness for new experience, in extroversion, and they had very low points for exceptional, uh, uh, especially for neuroticism, what means they are psychological stable. And there were, but of course there were other tests after I did it, there were some other scientists, especially in Germany who made uh, similar research, sometimes with people who were not as wealthy as, as my group, but they interviewed uh, more people. And they had two interesting ideas to edit. And one was external or internal locus of control. This is something that is very important. I had it with maybe, I described it in another way in, in my doctor dissertation, it's the question whether you believe that you are the master of your life or whether you think your life is controlled by, by others. And especially, and this was one important result from my research, um, whether you blame others or whether you blame the society or external circumstances for your failures and setbacks, or whether you blame yourself. You know, most of the people, they are this way. If they are successful, of course, they take the responsibility for their success. But if they fail, and if they have setbacks, or if they are crisis, they blame other people, or they blame the society. Even when they were bad at school, it's a teacher's fault, or when they didn't, you know, succeed in their company, it's the fault of their boss or whatever. But the attitude of my interviewers for this uh, book was quite different. They blamed always themselves, also for not only for uh, also for their failure and their setbacks. And this is not because they are kind of uh, masochistic, maybe, but this is because who you, you blame, you give the power. If you blame other people, you give power to other people. And if you blame yourself, it means. If it is my fault, then I have the power to change it. And this is what in this other study, what they called with uh, uh, external or internal uh, um, locus of control. Very interesting. And yes, when I read your book, I noted, I think even two of the wealthier people, perhaps they were billionaires, 
noted that even during the financial crisis of 08 and 09 and other like, it's my fault. Like I should have saw something coming and I took a hit. Now we'll get to the importance of bouncing back shortly, but that was a common trait that you picked up upon in that they didn't blame outside circumstances, even when outside circumstances were a little bit of black swan, a little bit of luck of the draw, they still took the responsibility that it's on them. They should have been smart enough to see it coming. Yes, you're, you're absolutely correct. Um, they, One of them said to me, even if the market goes in a different direction, it's not the market because I was wrong in predicting the market. You know, it's not this way. If the market goes in the direction as you predicted, then you say, okay, I was correct, but if the market goes in another direction as you predicted, of course, you you can't um, this this uh, you, you you can't influence everything that happens. Of course, there are things that that happen, but the question is, you are always free how you react. This is the most important thing, uh, whether things come along this way or the other way. But always, you are free. Uh, to make decision how to react to 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 these things. So I think this is also one thing that they had in common. And maybe I will I can add another thing that is very very important. You spoke about this um, gut feeling versus analysis, and I asked every one of them, how do you make your decisions? Your especially your entrepreneurial decisions. Is it more with analysis, with analyzing numbers, for example, or is it more gut feeling? And of course, both is necessary. There, there was almost no one who said, I decide everything with my gut or everything with, with numbers. But for most of them, gut feeling is much more important than analysis. And then the next question is, but what does it mean, gut feeling? And what does intuition mean and I, I I got a little bit deeper in this if you if you look at the psychology how we learn there are two ways how we can learn the one way is what we call explicit explicit learning and the other way is implicit learning what does it mean explicit learning means you study reading books or go to a seminar this is explicit learning. But then there is another way, implicit learning. You can call it also school of life or, or learning by doing your experience. And, and the result of this implicit learning is implicit knowledge. And gut feeling or intuition is only a more common word for what we call in psychology implicit knowledge. And this implicit knowledge is very important for entrepreneurs. By the way, this is something what intellectuals don't understand. Uh, I wrote another book, uh, The Power of Capitalism. And this book, I have a chapter, Why Intellectuals Don't Like Capitalism. And I linked it to the results of this research because they overestimate explicit learning. They think it's all about how many books have you read, uh, how good you were at school or not. But this was not important for this or, or wealthy people. I asked them how they were at school and university about their grades. And some of them were very good. Some of them were very, very bad. They even had no high school degree. So there was absolutely no correlation between their performance at school and university on the one hand, and the later financial success on the other hand. So this was not important. What was much more important was what I call this implicit learning experience. For example, half of them were competitive athletes. And as competitive athletes, they learn how to win, but much more important, they learned how to deal with setbacks and with uh, with with a crisis, uh, a lot of them were, were very early 
engaged in entrepreneurial activities, even when they were young, alongside school or alongside university. You know, when, when I was a student, most of the other students, they worked for an hourly wage. Some of them are taxi drivers or they worked in a restaurant or even in a factory, but most of them worked for an hourly wage, but not so these wealthy people. They didn't work for an hourly wage, but they, they earned money, for example, with sales or with entrepreneurial activities. And this is very important because um, I, there is something that I call today the employee mindset. And the employee mindset is to work for an hourly wage, whether you earn a lot or not. This is the employee mindset. But as an entrepreneur, you don't care about how, my, how many hours you work for something because the only thing that, that counts is the result in the end. No, none of your customers or clients ask you how many hours you worked for this or that. They, they ask for the results. And this is the difference between the, uh, the, what I call the employee mindset and the attitude of these people. But if you allow me, uh, let me come back to these intellectuals. These intellectuals, they don't understand this way of implicit learning. What, what, they, what they hear when they are young, the same with me, I come from a family with an academic background. You hear the more books you read, the better it is. And then they start to think uh, the people who read most books should be in the leading position in the society. And that this is all about how much books you have read or how good you were at the university. It, later in life, they learn that maybe they're from a school neighbor who read not as many books as they have, that he's much more successful in life than they are. And then they don't understand the world. Then they say, okay, something has to be wrong with the market economy or something has to be wrong with capitalism because my former school neighbor, he has now the bigger car, the bigger house, and what's worse, the more beautiful wife. And then you think there's something wrong with capitalism or with market economy because I read more books and I have this good grades at school and university and here it's not so capitalism does not work. But no, it's that he don't he does not understand the importance of implicit learning. And this was a very important result from my interviews that to sum up, there was no correlation between performance at school and university on the one hand and financial success on the other hand, but they had a lot in common, things that they out, did outside school, alongside school, this competitive sports or this activities in sales or entrepreneurship. These were the most important things for their later financial success. Wow. I mean, that was an amazing eight or nine minutes. You answered about five or six of my questions. Sorry, but, sorry I'm sorry. But no, that. That, that was great. So I have a, a well-known guest here in the U.S., Adam Robinson. He's been on several times. He's a wonderful investor. And he always talks about too much information is not good. You want to narrow down to the right information. And then, like you said, relative to more of a gut decision. Uh, you did give an example in the book. I forgot the nuances of the researcher, but they analyzed venture capital firms, which my audience would know very well. And the more information the venture capital firms had on the entrepreneur, the worse their decisions were in terms of investing in the entrepreneurs. It was maybe paralysis by analysis. Yeah, this is what most people think. The more information you have, the better is this. And of course, you need a kind of information, but uh, it's it, it, there, there were some scientific research, I quoted in the book, that it's not this way, the, the longer and the more you analyze, the, the better it is. No, the real art of success for people is to make decisions, even if you have not enough information at, at, at a time. This is the real art. And uh, of course, it's important to analyze things, but 
there comes there's what we you call gut feeling at that what was my point that this gut feeling isn't something irrational or mystical it sounds maybe like that but it's only the result of this process of um of implicit learning so uh, but but this is also a difference between between the ceo of a big company and an entrepreneur the ceo of a large corporation if they have a board meeting he can say or oh, why why did i make the decision oh, okay it's my gut feeling people would say here it's 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 stupid where's the analysis maybe they also decide with a gut feeling but then they ask people to give them some research to give them some numbers yeah, to support that, their to gut the part that is uh, right but uh, for the for the entrepreneur it's not necessary because he can make the and i know one of the he was not a part of my analysis but i know one of the richest uh, men here in in uh, uh, germany his name is uh, uh, rossmann uh, he he is the uh, the founder of um, he started with one grocery i think today he has 6000 in europe and he's a multi billionaire and he has no high school degree and he told me always i make all my decisions with this gut feeling and this is very often under underestimated and misunderstood what it really means oh, for sure for sure and i'm glad you mentioned sales too and i noticed some people i don't know why that has like a a dirty connotation when i talk at universities and i'm talking sometimes to uh people in business and entrepreneurship because of my role knowing lots of centimillionaires and billionaires and I'm going to be more anecdotal and less scientific than you, but that is something that I see as, especially for someone that may not be gifted with a 140 IQ and be an engineer, the ability to have emotional intelligence, the ability to listen, and the ability to understand others. Effectively, sales is such an important skill, and I do the best I could to instill the value for people in that, yet I... You know, maybe it's good because if everyone felt that way, then the crowd will be going in that direction and it won't stand out as being unique. So I, why don't oh, I ask uh, you? Yes, sir. Sorry. I agree. Absolutely. When I was young, uh, I worked for, for as a side job for, for a time in selling insurance policies. And there I saw it first. Time. I had two colleagues. The one was very smart. He knew everything every detail and he explained it to our clients and wrote so many you know piece of papers here this way this way this alternative and he was right he was brilliant but as a salesman not really good not really good and there was another one it was crazy he didn't want to fool the people but he was not really intelligent enough to understand it sometimes if i listen what he told people about this insurance it was not correct he didn't want to lie to them but he was not smart enough to understand all the details but we know who made more money. money but he was so very successful because he gave his clients the feeling here you are my friend don't worry about it i will do it for you i will solve your problem so and he was you know and this emotional intelligence that you mentioned and especially yes sales skills are so important and sometimes i ask people do you think you're good in sales and a lot of people say no they have as you mentioned it it has negative connotation maybe in europe even more than uh, even in yes. the United states it has a very negative because people associate wrong thing they associate someone for example who's like I do in this interview, talking, talking, talking very fast without any interruption. But when I was in sales, I was like you are today, like you, only asking a few questions and let the, the potential client talk, 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 because you can you can sell something to someone if you're talking or speaking all the time, you have to use your ears to listen. What is his problems? What is his priorities? And then after listening, you can sell. And so because people, they have this wrong association. I, I ask them people sometimes, are you good in listening to people? Yes, I am. That Okay, maybe you are good in sales because to listen 
to someone is much more important than talking, talking, talking without interruption. So sometimes people have wrong social. And I asked my interviewers from my book, how important were sales skills for your success? And almost everyone said sales skills are so very important, but so very important. And sales for them was not only to sell a product or to sell a a service maybe no one said to me everything is sales if you hire a new employee a good employee you have to sell your company to him if you have to get a government permission or if you want to get a loan from the bank it's all sales to convince other people and especially that you enjoy to turn a no in a yes you know, most people, if they hear no, it's end of discussion. But you know how it is. For a good salesman, it starts. I read this books about Steve Jobs. He's a perfect example. He never accepted any no from anyone. For him, it was always, he had fun to, to turn the, the no in the right. And for some of these people, even it's true for me, sometimes it's kind of sport, even in small little things, to turn the no in a yes for some weeks ago i was in a restaurant and i asked hey can you i, I want to order omelet and they know we, we don't have look there on the manual we have no omelet and i asked them but do you have eggs yes we have why can't you make an omelet so i have to ask the the chef in the, in the kitchen and in the end i got my omelet because i didn't accept the no and you know this is always also with little small things and i think this aunt this um this uh, uh, sales skills are so important and the bad thing, I don't know how it is in universities in the United States. I didn't study economics, but I had girlfriends, some they studied like uh, for MBA and they heard a lot about mathematics, formula, marketing theories. But then I asked him, what did you learn about sales at university? No, yeah. there was almost nothing. But sales is the decisive thing and in the end, it's all about sales to convince, to find new clients, new partners, and this is so important. And so my re recommendation for everyone who want to grow rich is first thing, you have to improve your sales skills and tr try it. Uh, it's the, of course, the most important thing is learning by doing, but also you can go to seminars or read some books about it. There are some great books about or seminars, how to learn to sell. In the end, of course, not everyone is a born salesman. If you if you see after after maybe two years, no, I'm, I'm really I tried everything, but I will never be a, a great salesman. Then you have to find a partner for your company who is good in sales, and this is how it happened. You know, from this uh, big uh, tech companies like Apple or Microsoft, there was also one guy who, were, who was much better in this technical stuff, and the other one like Bill Gates or Steve Jobs, who also understood something about the technical stuff, but was more like a marketing guy, a sales guy. And this is also so usually if someone is not good in sales, you can find a partner who is good in sales. Yes, if you're gonna be a solo entrepreneur, then bluntly, I don't care how smart you are, you have no choice. You have to be someone who's gonna to need to motivate people to their benefit in terms of moving forward. Now you could argue online, it could be a little bit more, it's nuanced. And yeah, I mean, I should basically, even for the super rich and mainly their children, probably do a whole, a series about the value from a sales perspective. Given that we have relatively a limited amount of time, ballpark about 15, 16 more minutes left, I do wanna talk about some other aspects of your book. First of all, we're gonna skip over some things that you do talk about, and I would agree, I read them. So Thomas Stanley's work on the millionaire mind, you all should read that, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. If we had a little more time, we'd do a deeper dive into both. And again, we'll have you back in the future. But simply, <laughs> although we knocked books a little bit, definitely read those books. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about the ability to, to take action, especially after failure. The ability to bounce back from a setback was a common trait 
that you found in your research. Talk a little bit about that. Yes, of course. This is the way how you how you react. Of course, if you have a setback, everyone feels bad. There's there's no exception. But the exception is how long. You know, there are different kind of people. Um, it's always it's also let's don't talk about business. Give you uh, another maybe funny example from daily life. I when I was young, I had a friend who was very successful with meeting with meeting women and if if he's invited someone maybe in a in a disco to a drink and she said no he said okay i don't care about it. there are enough others two seconds later he was the next one asked her and if she said no okay go to the number three asked her as long as he met someone to invite who accepted his invitation to a drink and there was another friend of mine and he looked he looked not worse than the other one he, he, he didn't look bad but when he got one no from a girl maybe for a half year or a year he stopped to talking to someone wow. because he was so frustrated and he always thought why did she say no and what happened there and tried to to analyze this or or felt bad and you know this is the difference no one feels really good if you have a setback or a crisis but i think one of the most important things that you have maybe some some habit and some not but i think always to a certain degree you can learn it how fast you say okay this is the past i can change things that happened in the past let's look now what is in the future i mentioned this this movie about Arnold Schwarzenegger. And one time when he even was successful, he lost one competition for this Mr. Olympia against Frank Zane, who was number sure. one and he was number two. And he was really desperate and he cried all night long. Of course, this is human, you know, that, but next day he woke up and said, okay, now you cried all night like a baby, forget all this shit, go to the gym, and look for the next time. And I think this is the, the difference. Um, and I try to learn from people. I, I give you I, I give you one example. Now it's a it's a difficult time in commercial real estate in the United States. And I'm invested in one commercial real estate fund in the United States. And I lost in six months. 2 million last six months, what also for me is a lot of money losing $2 million. And of course, I didn't feel feel good in, in this moment. But then, okay, I said, okay, you can change it now. You have to accept it now, make a new balance of your net asset value now. It's uh, 2 million less and accept it and go, go on. And there are some other people who who for month and month and month think about oh, why did it happen to me and all the stupid questions that makes no sense. Of course, you can learn something from setback and failure, but this negative way of worrying about things that you can't change, that um, you, people lose so much energy. I think we need all our energy for our decisions now and for the future. And so we can't lose energy about uh, with with worrying about things that you can change. And this was was something where this uh, people I, I had interviews with were re re really good at. Excellent. Uh, yeah, don't give up when things go wrong, because no matter who you are, no matter how smart you are, no matter how rich you are, things are going to go wrong, quote unquote wrong, and probably every day. You got to have more resilience and grit than that. Uh, I do have a series of quick fire, intriguing questions. Why don't we hold them off for two more minutes? In your book, you talk about the American psychologist, Robert Sternberg. And I like what he said, the concept of successful intelligence. According to his model, successful intelligence has an analytic, a creative, and a practical aspect. I think he defined it as analytical to solve problems, creative to decide what problems to solve and practical to make the solutions effective. Anything to add to that? 
No, and I don't want to, uh, first of all, compliment you are, I had a lot of interviews about this book all over the world, but I think you are the one who read it most thoroughly. Some of them I saw, they read only a conclusion or some pages. Uh, thank you for this. I and, But of course, I want to, I want that other people also read the book, so I will, I will, tell, I will not <laughs> tell everything in detail. Some people should really, you, you know, you can you can order it on, on Amazon. It's uh, the wealth elite. And no, it's, it's good as you summed up. Next question. This, this was a great book, by the way. I mean, my life has been in single family offices globally, often dealing with billionaires. So having more scientific and less anecdotal evidence and information is valuable for me. So I really absorbed it. Thank yes. you. Thank, thank you for this. This is always what people ask me. There are so many books about how to grow rich, what difference between this book and other books. It's really easy to answer. There are some other good books, I admit it, but also a lot of bad books. But most of them are not science-based, science you know, these are more like opinions, and some of them are good, and now, this is the reason why this book is very successful, especially in Asia. It's a success in China, it's a success in South Korea, and it's a success in Vietnam, because these people there are much more ambitious. Uh, maybe as a footnote, I commissioned a poll how important is it for people to become rich? Very interesting thing, not in this book, I wrote another book and some essays about rich people. And on average in the United States and Europe, 28% of our respondents said that it's important for them to become rich. But in, in uh, China, it was more than 50% in South Korea, it was more than 60%. And in Vietnam, it was more than 70%. Maybe you can say this has yeah. something to do because they are not established. They, you know, they, they had this, the past where they were poor not, long, not so long ago. But also in Japan, what is a developed country? I think it was something like 43%. I think with these Asians, they have this attitude you can learn a lot from about from their attitudes. And you see it also, if you look in the United States, the income pyramid, you see that there was uh, this black people, then this uh, Lat Latin people, Latinos, then white people, and then Asian people in this, if you analyze income pyramid in the United States. And I think they are very ambitious people, this uh, Asian people. Well, I mean, I was gonna hint at something relative to that in the West, which to me is most of Europe, Australia, and the US, becoming successful is almost looked down upon. It almost is a negative. And unfortunately, what we could go for hours about this subject. In Asia, in some of the countries you noted, it's respected, especially if you came from nothing and you took the risk and you built a company that is regarded as being a, a, almost a true hero. And Apparently, our heroes in the West are, I don't know, like, like musicians and social activists and all that, which have their purpose. I enjoy that, too. But things have gotten very skewed. Absolutely. I can, I agree. Maybe after, I, I will send you a link. I published some scientific papers in an economic uh, channel in, in the UK uh, because I did research. I, I, I published a book, The Rich in Public Opinion. This is about Maybe we can talk next time about it. It's about stereotypes and prejudice against rich people. And in Vietnam, they read this book at the universities. And half a year ago, they invited me at the university in Vietnam. And you know, they call themselves socialist and with the Communist Party, but it's harder to find a Marxist in university in Vietnam than in United States. I can That's guarantee Probably true. And, and they invited me, now listen, to workshop at the Foreign Trade University, that is one of the most prestigious universities in Vietnam, in Hanoi, the topic of the workshop was, how can we improve the image of rich people? How can we improve yeah. the image of rich people? I was never invited to a similar workshop. I speak of at universities, but never workshop with this topic. And you are absolutely right. It's, you know, it's positive. And in, this is a problem in our culture that people think always, if uh, not everyone, but a lot of people, they, they think negative if they hear about someone being rich. And 
I think these people, they harm themselves. So I, I give you a funny example, maybe. I, I, I read it, I said, I think two or three years ago, there were some protesters who positioned a guillotine in front of the house of Jeff Bezos from Emerson, the guillotine, you know, where people- Oh, yes, I would know. <laughs> revolution to show what they want to do with, with uh, Jeff Bezos. And there's another man, maybe like you would be this way, you prefer you buy a biography about the life of Jeff Bezos. And look, what can I learn from him? What can I adapt? And now I ask you this question, who will be more successful in life later on? The one who built the skier team to put it to position it in front of the house of Jeff Bezos or the one who bought the biography about his life to learn something from this. So I think- I this, this think we know. People. They don't harm others, they, they harm themselves. Because they I agree. Successful. We only have about six minutes left. I'm going to go round robin and we're going to go into a little bit of some sensitive topics. My audience knows it's probably gotten me in trouble, but I'm not afraid to ask these because these are real questions. When I look at, and we're probably going to go all anecdotal now, when I'm asking billionaires and when I'm just learning from them, I would say people like things in three. They want freedom freedom from the system, which yes, money does provide. Let's be honest about it. They do want status and mating. Now, other people would take my three words and they're not incorrect and put, the, put, put on that money, power, and sex. That is a reality of what makes the world go around. <laughs> Absolutely, Pat. And you know, um, a lot of people, are kind of, they, they have... Um, you know, because this sounds not politically correct, but of course it's true. If you, you know, the story that a, a young pretty girl falls in love with an old poor man, it's, it, it doesn't happen very often, you know? And so I think of course everyone knows it and it's true everywhere in the world that if you are successful and wealthy, that your possibilities to find a partner, for example, a, a, a beautiful, woman is of course easier than if you are if you are poor you, you can criticize it of course but you can't change it it was yeah i mean that comes down to evolutionary biology read the books of dr david buss his 37 culture study and the reality of money by scarce resources so yes we could go on about that strictly anecdotal a couple of quick others i know you only got four minutes left I have noticed, now maybe because they're older and I'm older, have you noticed that many people that are incredibly successful are not necessarily what I would know as specifically that good looking? Now, I notice weird things. I think I have a reason for this. The reason for that, now you may be better in corporate America, whatever, 6'2 and being good looking, I'm using a man as an example. I think when you're more average looking, but you make yourself into something, that forges you into the person you're going to become. You accept rejection. Things don't come to you easy. You have to put in the grind. You have to put in the work. You're not resting on your laurels of the lucky sperm club that you happen to be born genetically, quote unquote, good looking. And am I right or wrong? I, it's strictly anecdotal. I know that. Yes, I, I don't know. But in a way, of course, it can be correct in a way because it's about frustration tolerance. And if you are really, I, I had a friend, he was really handsome, but he, he had no idea how to reach out for girls because he hadn't to do this. There were enough girls without doing anything. When he was very young, that yeah, changes yeah, yeah. when they get out of college and they're not 22 handsome. anymore. But another one who is not, he has to develop more this frustration tolerance. And I remember here, this is Yeah, funny. you mentioned him. This, but yes, but this uh, is thing. Um, two final super yeah. quick topics. Have you found any correlation or is it strictly anecdotal of people that are very, very, very successful and religious, effectively believe in God? I didn't ask it. It's a good, it's a good question. It, it would be interesting, but I, I didn't ask, so I, I can't say anything about it. Okay, my last topic, and it is a bit of a sensitive topic. Uh, I believe it may be the billionaires only, but maybe it was the centimillionaires. I think 15% of them are women. Now, that number is increasing. A couple of years ago, I think it was 12%, 13%.
And I get it, societal expectations of a woman taking care of the family, often the parents, a perspective of things that might have been against them 20 or 30 years ago. I do understand societal aspects are absolutely impactful to that. But again, I'm not afraid to push the envelope a little bit. I have to think there may be something deeper. Men have 17 times the level of testosterone. We sometimes do real stupid things based on emotions, on passions, on quote unquote aggressiveness. Is there some truth that men are by nature, part of it societal, part of it societal, but also by nature, we tend to be greater risk takers. And again, I know it's probably anecdotal. Um, yes, I think that men are more uh, risk, risk takers. And I think the number, you know, in, from my interviews, there was only, there was only one, uh, one wow. woman and 44 men. And if you analyze the list of the wealthiest people in the world, and you subtract the heirs. You have to subtract them. You know the True. widows and the and the daughters. And if you subtract them, I don't think that it will be like you said at fifteen percent. I I didn't count it then, but I think it will much less than fifteen percent. Look at the list of the richest people in the world, and then. For example, subtract in the United States, the, 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 there's the Walton family, but but this is, you know, Sam Walton, their father or the grandfather made the money. And if there's now some, you know, female from the uh, Walton family, it's uh, it's the, the heir. But if, if you subtract them and only look at the people who made it first, I think it will change. And I, I made no research about the reasons, but fortunately, there's not a demand for quota for the billionaires list or something like this, because we, we have demand for quota in, in every kind of society, but there's no quota for this. No, and I do believe, again, absolutely part of it is societal. Things are changing. They're changing to the betterment. And there's many, many men that are horrific entrepreneurs and sometimes taking too much risk and burning out when you have obligations to a family and others is not a positive thing. So and, again, and we want question, to have open discussions. And it's also a question of culture. I found, for example, in Vietnam, women as entrepreneurs have a much more important role. Uh, and even Vietnam, by the way, was the only country where more, in our survey, more women than men said that it's important for them to grow rich. In all other countries, it was more men. In Vietnam, it was more women. So, it, so thank you for this. Uh, great conversation. I look very much forward for the next one. Maybe we can talk about here. This is my today. I had this interview in, in Fox News about it. Of in course. Independence of capitalism. This is one of my favorite topics. Uh, I would be because it. I told you compliment for this. I appreciate it. It's very rare that someone reads the book as thoroughly as you did it. And I have a lot of, I have everyday interviews about it and I see whether someone read the book or, or not. And, and even sometimes if I post this book, for example, on, on Facebook or Twitter, there are some left wingers who said, this is shit, it's all wrong. And then I ask, hey, have you read the book? No, I would never read a book like this. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, both sides can make plenty of mistakes, but certainly my experience as well. My audience knows I'm a hardcore capitalist. Uh, so I completely agree. Uh, Dr. Zittleman, I know you have to run. I'm going to give about a two minute wrap up to my audience, but I know you have to split now. It was such an honor and a pleasure. I look forward to rereading your book, reading your book about capitalism and sometime before the end of the year, having you back on. Great. Absolutely. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank, Thank you. you. And everyone, again, as I started, I'm Angelo Robles, the host of the Angelo Robles podcast. And I'm still the founder of Family Office Association. But again, I sold my interest, a wonderful new team. They're going to do a great job. But I am the founder and CEO and janitor of SFO, that stands for Single Family Office Continuity, and Family Office TV. So lots of initiatives going on. As you can see, I may know a little bit about this subject. I'm excited about it. Uh, and I'll be doing something kind of a 
billionaire mastermind something to announce in the coming months relative to that as well. And I have lots and lots of research and hands-on experience going back almost 20 years now. Uh, so I look forward to learning from others like Dr. Rainier Zittleman, but also sharing some of my insights and part of my dream team and my network as well. So simply stay tuned. We hope you all enjoy this, have an opportunity to buy The Wealth Elite by Dr. Rainier Zittleman. That's R A I N E R and last name Z is in zebra, I T E L M A N N. I would pronounce it Rainier, although not technically proper in German, Zittelman. Uh, and the book, The Wealth Elite, unless you read German, make sure you buy the English version. Uh, it was a wonderful read. I greatly enjoyed it. I know many of you will too. So I am back. You're going to see me more commonly now. You could reach out to me anytime. Probably the best email is my personal brand. And you could find me all across social media on DMs. That's more than fine. But Angelo at AngeloRobles.com. Again, Angelo at AngeloRobles.com. Reach out to me anytime. Subscribe to my YouTube channels because there will be two with Family Office TV to complement my other core, quote unquote, at Family Office. So again, I hope you enjoyed it. Look forward to the next time. Thank you all so much.